This morning, I would like to begin my message with a word of prayer. So if you would bow with me. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we, we want to thank you and praise you for being who you are, a God who loves us regardless of what we have done, and Heavenly Father, a God that loves us not because of what we do, but because of simply that we are. As we come before your throne, Lord, I just want to lift up our nation to you. We are a nation that is deeply, deeply divided. And Heavenly Father, there is, there is anger and there is animosity that, quite frankly, I, I just can't completely understand. Heavenly Father, as I preach this morning, I would ask that you would just give me your words. That, Heavenly Father, you would help me to present my concerns in a way that don't show that I have any sort of agenda and that heavenly you father you prepare our hearts in such a way that we would receive the gospel message that is in your word all these things I ask and I pray in Jesus precious and holy name amen <clears throat> you know there's been many events Events this last week, events in the last month, in the last year, as, and even further back, that should cause us to pause and really stop to think. The deep political and social divide among people in our nation and intolerance for people that have different views than we do. I get that there are a lot of people that don't like Donald Trump. What I don't get is the, the vehemence, the anger, the hatred that people have expressed for him over the last four years. I get that Donald Trump says stuff without thinking. And that there's a lot of times he says things that would have much, much been better off unsaid. But honestly, as you look back at the last four years of his presidency, policy-wise, in the things that he has done, has he really been that horrible of a president? His desire to put up a barrier to, to stop illegal immigrants from coming in, is that really that horrible of a thing that we've made it out to be? His desire for fair trade between China and the other nations and the United States, is that really a horrible thing? The... Um, the pursuit of creating a vaccine for a pandemic in a way that we had a vaccine in 11 months, something that normally takes years and years to happen. Is, is that a bad thing? The peace that he's brought to the Middle East, is that a bad thing? The way that he forced pharmaceutical companies to lower their drug prices so that average people don't have to pay as much for their medicines. People who are like on insulin and people who need EpiPens. Is that worth impeaching a president over? I mean, when it really comes down to it, and we have sought to 
throw this guy out of office for four years. First, because he supposedly colluded with Russia, and then he uh, supposedly was guilty of quid pro quo when he congratulated a guy on his win in a foreign country. When we have an incoming president who literally did exactly that thing on public television, yet we impeach the president over it when there was really no evidence of it at all. And now we're set to impeach him again in less than 10 days of his remaining term in office because supposedly he caused people to overtake the government building. And I guess just like he's guilty for every single person who came down with COVID in America because somehow that's his fault too, as he's been accused of. Okay, I get that there's a lot of people that don't like him. What I don't get is why they're so hateful about it. I mean, I'm not particularly fond of Hillary Clinton myself personally, but I don't spend every waking minute thinking about how I can destroy the woman. Right? Do you see what I'm saying here? We live in this society that has become so hyper divided so hugely divided that there's like no middle ground when the riots were taking place in portland and seattle the news media was saying you know this is great this is people you know expressing their right to you know say what they wanted to do and then when a million people show up in washington dc because they feel like the election wasn't fair, suddenly these people are rioting and they're in subordination and they're these horrible, horrible people. The Capitol building hasn't been burnt down like a lot of stuff is in Seattle and Portland. Was it right? Absolutely no, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that anything that happened there was okay. It absolutely wasn't, okay? Just like nothing that has happened in Portland and Seattle is okay. It's okay to disagree. It's not okay to burn down, you know, car dealerships and break down build, uh, store windows and, and steal stuff out of there. It was wrong to steal Nancy Pelosi's lectern and her laptop. There's no excuse for that, right? But this... This division that we're seeing in our nation, it really troubles me. Because we have this division that if something doesn't change, we're, we're reaching irreconcilable differences. And I'd submit to you that the real issue here is not political. I mean, it is. But the deep-seated issue is spiritual. Because <clears throat> when I am only concerned about myself, then I'm only going to do what benefits me. It's Christianity that tells us to make other people more important than ourselves. It's Christianity that says to turn the other cheek. It's Christianity that says to love your enemies and to pray for those that hurt you. Not the, what the world says. It says it's every man for themselves. And to be quite honest, I'm troubled by the division that we see, the animosity and the hatred that both sides have exhibited. I'm troubled by the fact that we continue to remove God from our society and from our government. And I'm afraid about where that path is going to come out and where it's going to ultimately lead us. We need to wake up. America is being fundamentally changed by a relatively few people with a very real agenda. And if we don't wake up to what's happening soon, 
we won't even be able to recognize the America that we know and love. Our biggest problems are not political, but they're spiritual. Decisions have consequences. And that brings me to my message this morning. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 through 7, it says this, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Do not put to death men, or put to death men, women, children, and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them in um, at Telim, two hundred thousand foot soldiers and ten thousand men from Judah. Saul went from the city of Amalek and set on set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, "Go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them." For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havla to Shur to the east of Egypt. Now, there are people who have said, How could a loving God order the slaughter of men, women, children, infants, Everything, cattle, sheep, the whole deal. How could, how could a loving God order that kind of punishment? And I want you to understand that what's happening here is God, Israel has become the hand of God's judgment. When Abraham wandered in the wilderness, God promised him the land of Canaan. But he said to Abraham, one day this will be your inheritance. But not yet, because the iniquity of the people here is not yet full. In other words, God wasn't ready to judge those people for their sins yet. He was giving them time to repent. 400 years later, God was ready to judge the people for the sins that they had committed for well over 400 years. He also knew that if those people were allowed to remain in the land, that they would lead the Israelite people back into idolatry. Which is why God gave them certain rules and gave them certain instructions. They were not to marry the Canaanite people because he knew that the Canaanite people would lead them into idolatry. Initially, God said, you know what? I want you to completely destroy these people as my hand of righteous judgment. But they didn't do that. And they became a thorn and a stumbling block for the Israelite people ever since. You know, in this particular instance, it was God's using Israel as his hand of judgment. Years later, God will use Assyria and godless Babylon to do the very same thing to Israel and to Judah. And I think the important thing here to keep in mind is that um, God is in control and ultimately all nations and all people will have to answer to him. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. In fact, it may be 400 years from now. But ultimately, nations, not only people, will answer to God for their actions. And God doesn't require the use of somehow uh, godly people to enact his judgment. He can use whatever he deems necessary. He can use... um, a godless people from another nation to bring his judgment. He can use a derecho if he chooses to execute his judgment. He can allow terrorists to fly airplanes into buildings if that's his desire to bring judgment to people. 
if he so desires, he can use a pandemic. And I'm not saying any of those things were God's hand of judgment, but I'm saying that God is not limited in the way that we think he is. He can use whatever he sees necessary to try and get our attention. Are you with me? God gave some specific instructions for Saul. He gave Saul a task to do. In 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Go now attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, and sheep, camels, and donkeys. You know, a lot of us spend a lot of time seeking what God's will is. We spend time in prayer. We spend time studying God's word. Here, it couldn't have been more laid out for, for Saul in, if he'd asked for it. Samuel specifically tells him what God wants him to do. There's no wiggle room here. He didn't say, well, Saul, if you feel like it, I have this thing that you can do for me. He said, this is what I want you to go do. Right? God intended Israel to be a witness to the world. When God chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to make a great nation out of them, his intention was that the world would see the Israelite, the Hebrew people, and be drawn to God. They had a process for bringing people in. It was a word called proselytizing, where they would bring Gentile people in and make them Jewish people. They would make them um, worshipers of Yahweh God. And God's intention was for the people to be this beacon, this light to the rest of the world that would draw the rest of the world to God through them. Did Israel do a very good job at that? No. No, they did not. In fact, um, they didn't want proselytes much at all. They were proud that they were God's people, and we don't need anybody else. It was kind of the mentality that they had. They, they did proselytize some, but not ever to the extent that God intended. God intended Israel to be a light to the world. And, you know, I truly believe that God has used America to be a light to the world as a Christian nation. When they have looked to America, they have looked to America as a nation that is a Christian nation nation that is not necessarily true today we are not the nation that we once were when I was younger growing up um, there was a guy by the name of Robert Morris that came to our house a few times if you ever read the book Exodus from a Hidden Valley Robert Morris was a young man at the time um, he was in China when the Iron Curtain fell. And they were given a notice from China that they had 30 days to leave the country. And one of their family members was very ill and they were unable to travel. He was unable to travel and so they missed that 30-day deadline. And so the communist China came after them seeking to kill them. And um, he relate in the book, it relates these miraculous stories of things that happened that God did that supernaturally protected these people. When Robert Morris was at our house, <clears throat> he talked, and one of the things that he had said is that in America, we have not seen a lot of the things that he saw in China demonic type things because he said America has been clean soil. There hasn't been a lot of demonic activity here. Um, there are things that we that we can do 
that I think allow that to happen. I think when we do mess with tarot cards, we open ourselves up to the spiritual realm there in a very dangerous and in a very bad way. When we play Dungeons and Dragons, I think a similar thing. I think that we, because it uses stuff that is straight from the occult in the rules and, and stuff in the play of Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons is one of the few games where you can choose to actively make your character evil. And so um, there are things I think that, that we can do that open us up to that kind of n really bad demonic spiritual influence. That hasn't been in America because America was founded as a Christian nation. But that is very quickly beginning to change. And just as Israel ceased being the light that God intended them to be, my fear is that America is ceasing to be that Christian light that we have been since the founding of our nation. The second thing that I think that we can see here is that Saul chose to disobey God. Saul chose to disobey God. In 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 11, it says this, Then Saul attacked the Amal Amalekites all the way from Havlah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agog, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag, the best... What a name. How would you like to go through life with that one? The best of their sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good, these... They were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I, I am sorry that I have made Saul king because he turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and cried out to the Lord all night long. You know, there is a principle that you can see in the Old Testament regarding uh, Israel and Judah, those nations, over and over and over and over again. And that is this. And you can take this to the bank because it is just the way that it is. As the leadership of a nation is, so goes the country. When there were good kings, the people worshiped God. When there were bad kings, the people were actively involved in idolatry. As the leadership of the nation was, so went the race, rest of the nation. You know, that's why it is amazing to me that Saul chose to save King Agag and killed everybody else off. I mean, the leadership, the king, sets the tone for the direction of the rest of the nation. And yet Saul chose to spare him. The danger in this is that he was not obedient. He was not completely obedient to what God did. God was very, very clear. God didn't say, I want you to kill some of them. He said, I want you to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now, we can sit here and we can discuss the ethics of that. We can have an ethical debate on it. But ultimately, it's not our choice to make. It's God's. And so Saul reached a point where uh, he chose to only carry out part of God's task. He carried out the parts that he wanted to, and he left undone the parts that he didn't. You know, America as a nation has begun this consistent behavior of also choosing what we want to do with God's word and what we don't want to do with God's word. We have the Ten Commandments carved into the doors of the Supreme Court, and yet we have declared that prayer is illegal in our schools. We declare that in our Constitution that um, we have the inalienable light right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of, of 
happiness, which literally meant in that day the pursuit of property, the, the ability to own your own piece of property, the, this inalienable right, which means that it's given by God himself to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yet we declare that there are no rights for children that are still in the womb. Because it's a woman's right to choose. What about the choice of the child? What I'm saying is this. I feel like as a nation, we are doing the very same thing that Saul did with the Amalekites in his orders that we're picking and choosing which parts of those things that God says that we should do or shouldn't do. Not because God said so, but because eh, we don't particularly feel like doing that. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do the things that I tell you to do? The third thing that we can see is that Saul lost his kingdom because of his disobedience. Saul literally lost his kingdom because of his disobedience. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, Lord, the Lord bless you. I carried out the Lord's instructions. But then Samuel said, then what is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. So when Saul gets caught, suddenly he says, oh, well, we saved the very best so that we could sacrifice it to God. <clears throat> okay, does God want your sacrifice or would he prefer your obedience? When you tell your child to clean their room, would you rather have them their obedience or would you rather have them come up to you and say, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry I didn't clean it? Wouldn't you rather that they did the right thing the first time? Why would we think that God is any different? <clears throat> so he tried to save. He tried for a save here by saying, okay, we're just going to sacrifice that stuff to God, but it didn't wash. It didn't wash with God, and it didn't wash with Samuel. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, God, or Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than, to, than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul reached a point where there were no more second chances. He reached a point where God said, that's it. We're at the end of the road. We're not going any farther. How many of you have heard people that have said, I know this is wrong, but I can always ask God to forgive me later? Have you ever heard anybody ever say that or think that? Um, for Saul, there was a point where there was no more second chances. In Hebrews, it says this, if we continue to sin willfully after having knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains any sacrifice for our sins, but only the fearful expectation of a judgment that is to come. What is that? What do those verses say? Those verses say that if we continue to willfully sin, that there is a point where God says, that's it, end of the road. Not going any farther. 
And that kind of goes against this idea that we have developed over the years that as long as we repent, God will always say it's okay. After all, he's a loving God, right? Even in the Old Testament, there was no means for willful, deliberate, disobedient sin. In the Old Testament, it was called sins with a high hand. Where I know it's wrong, I don't care, I'm doing it anyway. There was no provision for sacrifice for those kinds of sins in the Old Testament. And isn't that really what we're doing when we say, I know it's wrong, I'm going to sin anyway, and I'm just going to ask for forgiveness later? Isn't that really the exact same thing? We're saying, I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. Is that where we're coming as a nation? We say Where we say, I know that my behavior is wrong, but I really don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. You know, when Roe v. Wade happened and abortion was legalized, there's a lot of things that we didn't know. Today, that's not true. Through ultrasound, through our better understanding of pregnancy, we know that the heart starts beating within like seven days. That babies inside the womb dream. That um, <clears throat> even at like, I can't remember what it is, like 22 weeks, some crazy thing, we've actually had children survive outside of the womb. Today, we don't have the excuse that we had when Roe v. Wade happened. We know better. And to willfully, as a nation, continue to do it because it's convenient for me kind of puts us in the exact same boat that we find Saul in, doesn't it? You see, if America continues to turn her back on God, God will eventually judge her. God said of Israel as a nation, I have loved you with an everlasting love. But it wasn't enough to keep him from sending them into captivity because of their idolatry. If God didn't spare Israel with whom he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. What makes us think that as a nation that we are above God's judgment, that God could never judge America for our willful disobedience to him? I love America. America is the greatest country that has ever existed. As, as, at least that's what I believe. That's how I feel. I love America. America has been this great country. It has been this beacon to, to nations and people who have been homeless and poor and outcast. But you can't thumb your nose at God forever and not expect there to be some sort of repercussions. So where does that leave us? I think that Christians in this nation, we ought to be praying as we have never prayed before. We need to pray for this country. We need to pray for people. We need to pray for our leaders, that they will make decisions that are pleasing in God's sight. Because as the leadership of a nation is, so goes the country. We need to pray for revival that God will send a revival to this nation and draw us back to himself. Because the real answer to our problems is not whether or not we have a Republican or a Democrat as president or a Republican or Democrat-controlled House or Senate. The 
the real answer to our nation is whether or not Jesus is king in the hearts and lives of his pe- of 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 our of our people when that happens a lot of the other problems will just naturally go away they'll take care of themselves There's a lot of things that I can't do as an individual. I certainly don't want to be president of the United States. There's not enough money in the entire world to make that something that I would look at. That, as far as I'm concerned, that is the most thankless job (laughs) in America today. But I can pray for my president. I can pray for my congressmen and my senators. I can pray for my community and for my neighbors to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I can choose not to be a part of the division that is so rampant in our nation right now. And I can pray that God will find ways to use me in the little corner of the world that I'm in. I hope that you're like me, that you love our country. And that you pray that it will continue to be a light to the world around us for generations and generations to come. But I'm convinced that that can only happen if we become the Christian nation that we started out as. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn is hymn number 469.